perfect. So we have been discussing about the sampling of continuous time signals and then sampling of discrete time signals so far. Uh, today, the goal is to study discrete time processing of continuous time signal. And this particular topic is of very, very high importance in today's world because in most situations that you would encounter in modern systems, there is always a continuous time signal. There will always be several continuous time signals, all of which will be sampled and processed in discrete time. And then some actions will be taken in the, again, in the continuous time domain. So there's a lot of, uh, discrete time processing that happens for continuous time signals. So just to give you an example, uh, we are having this discussion over or having this uh, lecture over Zoom. So I'm going to show you from the audio settings or statistics. Uh, can everyone see my screen? Like uh, the statistics of the Zoom audio? Yes. Yeah. All right. So you are able to see the settings, right? So as you can see, I'm speaking in continuous time, right? So my voice is a continuous time signal. But if you look at the audio setting for Zoom, the Zoom is recording my audio at a rate of 24 kilohertz. So one over T, one over capital T, where T is the sampling time, it's one over capital T is 24,000, okay? Uh, video, okay, video, I don't have a video yet. Uh, so if you look at the screen sharing, so right now I'm sharing my screen while I'm writing something on on the, uh, on the my uh, OneNote, and you see that this frames per second, so 17 frames per second, so it's taking 17 pictures or 19 pictures or 16 pictures um, within every second. So one over T, is or t one over t is equal to 17 or 15 or 18 whatever number you see frames per second you see here so even though everything that we are doing is happening in continuous time you see that every software is using is trying to take samples of continuous time signal process it send it at your particular computer and then you are able to see it and and um, uh, listen to whatever I'm saying. Okay, so this happens all the time. Continuous time signals are being converted into discrete time signals, and then those discrete time signals are processed in certain way. And then that process signal is then converted into a continuous time signal and displayed on your computer screen. Well, it's not really, uh, I'm not sure if it is uh, converted back to continuous time or not, but today we will talk about uh, converting it back to continuous time. But in the case of software systems, once it becomes a discrete time signal, it's basically discrete time pretty much everywhere. So even your speakers are working with a discrete time signal, not a continuous time signal. Although speakers can use a continuous time signal, but they don't because you know we are all in discrete time world nowadays. So here is what the usual schematic of this whole system is. So I have a continuous time signal XCT. It goes through a conversion process and it converts the signal into a discrete time signal. Let's denote it by XDN. So D for discrete time signal and N is the time step for discrete time signal. Then there is some processing. And this is basically a discrete time system. And then after the processing, I get an output of the discrete time system. And then I have conversion to continuous time. and I get YC of T.
and we are going to look at all the components within this red block. So you can imagine this part is my voice or my screen. And this is all captured. So this is the entire system zoom. Well, and I'm, I'm doing some cheating. There is no conversion to continuous time at your computer. But let's assume that there is something that converts everything to continuous time in your system. And so this is what you are listening. or seeing on monitor. So this part is typically not there in software systems. But there are other situations like control systems or electricity systems or power grid or satellites where you have to work with after conversion to continuous time. But in software systems, it's not necessarily the case. Okay, so this is what we are going to do today. Any questions so far? Okay, so in what follows, we will model this discrete time system using an LTI system. And we will say that the transfer function is, a, or the frequency response of the system is HD, which, is, which stands for the frequency response of the discrete time system. And if you look at this whole system going from end to end, so XCT to YCT, Let's call this whole system uh, with a transfer function, uh, not a transfer, frequency response at C of J omega. And what we want to understand in today's discussion, pretty much for the next 20, 25 minutes, we will try and understand what's the relationship between this at C we have for this end-to-end -end system, continuous time system with this HD, which is what we have picked as the processing uh, of the discrete time system. What's the processing transfer function or discrete time system for this uh, discrete time? What am I saying? I'm saying, so HD is the, sorry, you might hear my daughter crying in the background. And uh, okay, so, let me be on mute for just a couple of minutes. There's no shame in it. Yeah. I'm sorry for the brief interruption. Uh, okay, so uh, what I was saying is we want to understand the relationship between this uh, frequency response of the continuous time system and the frequency response for the discrete time system that's doing all the processing in the discrete time signal domain. Okay, so Let's uh, jump right into individual blocks. So I have this continuous time signal. I multiply it with an impulse train. I get a XP of T, which is also a continuous time signal. And it's given by That's the expression for XP of T. And then it goes through analog to digital conversion. Analog to digital, let me just write it here. 
analog to digital conversion. And what I get is X D N, which is equal to X P N T. So I have an analog signal XPT and I'm going to convert it to a digital signal XDN. Okay. Now this XDN will go through a discrete time signal and let me change the omega to capital omega. So this is HD e raised to J omega, capital omega. This is the discrete time system. And from it, what we will get is YDN. And then it will go through a digital to analog conversion. And what I will get is YP of T. And I need to write what YP of T looks like. So let me write it below. So YP of T would be Y So this is my digital to analog conversion. And then I'll pass it through a ideal low pass filter and I will get YC of T. Just out of curiosity, um, you have, for the HD E to the J um, Omega, uh, Omega, yeah. um, is there a reason you chose that specific form of the symbol, or, or does it matter? Well, it doesn't matter. Omega is uh, just a frequency, so no, no, no. I'm sorry, not not the Omega, not where the low pass is. It's the the HD E to the the J part with the yeah. ohm symbol. Right, right. So this is is that Omega. Yeah, this is capital Omega. So this is Oh my gosh, uh, this I feel stupid. I did not know that. Yeah. Yeah. So it's just used as a symbol for resistance as well, but it's actually a capital Omega. Oh, okay, thank you. Thank you for clarifying. Yeah. So so I'm using capital Omega because uh, we will use for this particular lecture, we will use Omega as frequency for the continuous time system and this as a frequency for discrete time system. And the two frequencies are going to be quite different. So that's why we have to use distinct symbols. Otherwise, we'll get confused. OK, thank you. Yeah. OK, so this is what the end-to-end -end system is going to look like. Now let's look at the overall. So so we want to consider this transfer function. We want to look at the transfer function within this red block. So in order to compute the transfer function, we have to look at individual signals and what does the Fourier transform for individual signals look like? And then on that basis, we can just do the transfer function to, we can compute the transfer function at C of J omega as Y C of J omega over xc of j omega. So this is what we want to find out. And we will look at the Fourier transform for each of the individual subsystems. And from that, we will extract the frequency response of this end-to-end -end system. OK, that's what we are going to do now. Um, also, really quickly, we you saw you showed the equation for yp of t. Right. Um, 
but then you send it through the low pass filter. So yes. wouldn't we be more interested in figuring out what YC of T is? So that's what we want to figure out, right? But it has to go through a low pass filter so that uh, oh, this, impulse, Sorry. this is like an impulse train getting multiplied to YC of T. Okay, so okay this I see is what you're saying. going to be equal to YC of NT delta T minus NT. So in order to extract YC, we need to pass it through the low pass filter. Okay. So we have XCT and the Fourier transform is XC of J omega. Then we have XPT, which is XCT multiplied by PT. And this is given by summation N equals minus infinity to plus infinity. XCNT delta T minus NT. And therefore my XP of J omega is given by So there are two equivalent expressions for XP. So let me just write down both the expressions. Uh, the second expression was uh, derived in the first, uh, maybe on le in lecture 26. So this is XC J omega minus K omega S. And I think this was lecture 25 or maybe 24. That's where we derived the second expression for XP. So both these expressions are valid. Let me just box it because we'll need both these expressions very shortly. Okay, any, I hope there are no questions at this point of time. Um, can you just go back to the previous page for yes. just of one course. second? I just missed something. Yeah, of course. Of course. yeah I was at the bottom uh, oh. with the, the transfer function in red. Okay. Okay. Okay, yeah. well, I see over XC. Okay, great. Thank you. That's all. Sure, sure. Okay, now let's look at my XD of N. This is exactly XP of NT. So I can write it as Okay, well, and this is also same as XC of NT. Okay, so I, I, I don't want to give it any other name. Now my XD of E raised to J omega. So now I'm going in discrete time. So I'll use a different symbol for omega. It's given by, it's the Fourier transform of XD of N. So
So I can write it as XC of NT Okay, so I use this fact that XD of N is equal to XC of NT, and then I take the Fourier transform of this signal XD, discrete time signal XD, which is given by this expression, and then I just substituted XD of N with XC of NT. That's all I did. And so I get the expression for this xd of e raised to j omega in terms of xc and some exponential term. Now I want you to look at, this is equation one and this is equation two. What, uh, what's the difference between equation one and equation two, just the right side? Um, well, we have the um, capital XP to, to, of J omega, but in the, oh, you said the right side. I'm looking at the left. Yeah, just right. the right side, not the left side. Is it something to do with the um, omega versus, um, actually, never mind. I'm not sure. Equation yeah. one has a capital T. Right. Exponent. Correct, correct. So we have a capital T in the exponent here in the continuous time signal, but we don't have that exponent in the discrete time signal. Uh, so that's the diff so so then we could get xt in terms of xp by just dividing the omega by capital T. So from one and two, we get the following conclusion. X D of E raised to J omega is X P of J omega over T. Okay. So that follows from equation one and two. Now remember that I had mentioned that my XP of J omega also has this additional expression, right? The two expressions are equivalent. So therefore I can substitute that and, sorry, I don't know what's happening, okay. And I can write my x d of e raised to j omega as one over capital T summation So two pi over T is the omega S and I get the expression for XD, capital XD in terms of capital XC.
Okay, any questions so far? So I want everything in terms of XC because in, in the end, I have to do YC over XC in order to get the value of FC, the frequency response of the overall end-to-end -end system. Okay. Now remember that this XD of N goes through a discrete time system, HD e raised to J omega, and we get YD of N. Perfect. So this I know, this, this is very easy. So I know my YD of E raised to J omega will be given by HD E raised to J omega times XD E raised to J omega. Okay, now YDN will go through a digital to analog conversion and make it a impulse train. So YP of T, and then it will go through a low pass filter, sorry, I guess, Y, P of T, then it goes through a ideal low pass filter and we get YC of T. Okay, so certainly this particular low pass filter will kill all the frequencies that are above. Let me just write it. So this low pass filter, because it's an ideal low pass filter, it will kill all frequencies above omega C and below minus omega C. Okay, now what about this conversion YDN to YPT, which is going through a digital to analog conversion? So this is going to be the inverse of when we go from XC to XD. So, sorry, when we go from, okay, so let's look at this expression. So this is in terms of XD, which is in terms of XC. So when we look at y, well, okay. So this is xd in terms of xp. Now we are doing the opposite conversion. So we'll get yp as xd. Okay, so let's look at yp j omega will be yd e raised to j omega t. This is the inverse of, this is inverse of
Okay, so we have we have figured out what exactly is going to happen in individual blocks. Now we can combine everything together. And what we get is as follows. So this, of course, this combination is not that obvious. Uh, you will have to spend a lot of time uh, going through each of the individual components and then figuring out which are the frequencies that will get killed and which are the frequencies that will pass through without any attenuation. So it's going to take some effort, but in the end, what you will observe is your HC of J omega is given by HD of E raised to J omega T for omega less than omega C and it's zero for omega greater than omega C. And this is the main result. This is our the main result for today's discussion. What we have done is we have identified what the overall transfer function at C of the end-to-end -end system looks like in terms of the transfer function of the discrete time system you have picked, which is doing the digital to digital data processing. Let me give you a brief uh, intuition about why this should be true. So remember that because of this low pass filter, anything that happens at high frequencies will be zero because, because we are using a low pass filter. Um, oh, I'm, I'm implicitly assuming no aliasing. So please add this. I'm implicitly assuming that you're sampling at a much higher rate than the Nyquist rate. So there is no aliasing throughout the process. So your omega S is greater than two omega M. So assuming that your, there is no aliasing, your low pass filter will kill all the frequencies above omega C and here we know that yp of j omega is equal to yd of e raised to j omega t. And in the case of yd of e raised to j omega t, you will replace this omega with small omega t. And so that's where hd of e raised to j omega small omega t would come into picture. Okay, so this omega t will this omega will get replaced with this omega t here. And that's why we have this HD of E raised to J omega t for all frequencies that are within the cutoff frequency range. So that's the intuition, high level intuition of what's happening throughout the process. And this is exactly what uh, Zoom is trying to do and, and many other uh, video conferencing or audio conferencing sites are doing. Now, going back to the to Zoom example, let's go back to the audio setting statistics audio. Okay, so the frequency here is 24 kilohertz. Uh, what do you think is the frequency of our conversation? Like, like What's the frequency range of my voice and what's the frequency range of humans in general when they are talking? Anyone, anyone wants to take a shot? What do you think is the frequency range for our voices?
can someone do a quick google search and tell me what's the frequency range of human voices about 15 kilohertz 15 15 is maximum 15 is what singers and others and typically 20 kilohertz for younger adults and children oh um this uh, is all this is all very high frequency 2 to 5 kilohertz yeah 2 to 5 is what what our normal conversations typically are at so not when we are singing and stuff but when we are just conversing normally on a day to day basis so if you assume that our our frequency so let's let's go back to so this is 24 kilohertz i want you to remember this 24 kilohertz so if we speak at 5 sorry 2 to 5 kilohertz which means our omega m will be 2 pi times 5 kilohertz okay so what's the 2 times omega m 2 times omega m will be 2 pi times 10 kilohertz so my omega s must be greater than 2 omega m which means it should be greater than 2 pi times 10 kilohertz so which means now let's look at zoom so zoom is trying to zoom sampling rate for voice for audio is 24 kilohertz right so zooms omega s omega let me call it omega s zoom this is equal to 2 pi times 24 kilohertz so in other words omega s zoom is actually much greater than 2 omega m because our normal conversations the highest frequency is typically 5 kilohertz so so male voice is typically uh, you know 400 to 2000 hertz and female voice would be 600 or 800 hertz to 5000 hertz but of course 5000 hertz is extremely uh, like Uh, high frequency and typically normal conversations don't happen i mean if i'm if i'm if i'm shouting at someone not yeah if i'm shouting at someone then probably it will uh, if i'm angry at my daughter or something it might go to that frequency but generally it won't go to that frequency and therefore zoom is doing a very good job of sampling at a much higher frequency and therefore the audio quality from zoom is actually very good because of this high sampling rate however if zoom wants it can reduce the sampling rate to from 24 kilohertz it can reduce it to 12 kilohertz or 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 10 kilohertz and we won't really notice a lot of uh, like the audio quality will degrade but it won't really be impossible to hear each other on the other hand if we if we put a singer and if you're you know just listening to music over zoom um then things might become very bad like the audio quality will be really bad if they start sampling at 10 kilohertz or something so all in all the point is zoom is doing a good job of sampling um in in for for our audio signals and the same thing for video signals as well or screen sharing signals as well okay so going back to our uh, uh end to end transfer function so end to end transfer function is um a function of this hd which is the discrete time so what's happening in the discrete time system okay now let's go to the overall block diagram so we have our xc of t continuous time then it goes through some conversion to discrete time i get xd of n i have a discrete time system then i get yd of n and then there is conversion 
to continuous time and I get yc of t. And we just learned that hc of j omega is basically hd of e raised to j omega omega t for omega less than omega c and it's zero for omega greater than omega c. So this is what we have learned so far in today's class. And we also saw that the way Zoom is recording our audio, um, it's doing a good job. It's way above the Nyquist sampling rate, which is two omega M and therefore the audio quality is very good. And there is no aliasing in this end-to-end -end system. So this statement, oh, this is this statement holds for no aliasing. So omega S is greater than two omega M. And Zoom is satisfying this uh, condition. Now, now here in this case, we have assumed that this discrete time system is an LTI system, okay? And that is an assumption because most of the entire, most of the stuff you're doing in undergrad uh, with uh, feedback control systems or signals and systems, we are concentrating mostly on LTI system where the input is linearly transformed to the output uh, through a LTI uh, difference equation. Now, what happens in, so a lot of the, so this is, this is the past. This is something that people have been doing for maybe a hundred years or something uh, since the computers were born. Now, one of the things that happens in today's, in, in modern world, which is, you know, since, uh, since the microprocessor revolution in 1970s and 1980s, uh, this discrete time system is becoming more and more powerful. Okay. So, I have this XTN, it goes through a microprocessor, which is connected to internet. And therefore it gets a lot of new information in besides the fact that there is some input signal and it can do heavy computation and it can convert XDN to YDN. So it can do heavy computation and it need not be linear. So not LTI. So I'm just telling you what's the difference between this particular situation that we just talked about and what happens in today's world. So what has happened is that this discrete time system has been replaced with a microprocessor, which is running some sort of operating system and it's connected to the internet. And this microprocessor is pretty powerful, so it can do a lot more manipulations than a general LTI manipulation. So it's not just solving a linear difference equation. It can actually do a lot more stuff. Uh, it can do optimization. It can do uh, uh, nonlinear signal processing um, and so on. Now, Now that is what is causing a lot of uh, improvement in the performance. So for instance, let's consider this Zoom example that I talked about. So I am talking and Zoom would like to record my signal, but at the same time, my HVAC system is running in the background and it's creating some white noise. Now Zoom wants to, if Zoom wants to create a better audio quality, it has to somehow filter out that particular white noise coming from an HVAC system. Now, one could argue that, okay, fine, you can have a discrete time filter of some sort, which will remove the noise from the system, but it may not be that good. And you could come up with a better software, which does some sort of nonlinear filtering or nonlinear transformation of the input signal which would remove the noise much better from, remove this HVAC noise much better. And so that is something that, um, that happens in this microprocessor, which allows you to get a much superior quality of output outside. So YDN may be a far superior quality than what the input signal is. And this is 
something that's happening in every field. So you pick any field and everywhere they had a very dumb discrete time system and they replaced that dumb discrete time system with a microprocessor that is connected to the internet, which allows them to change the algorithm that's doing that, uh, H, change this HD uh, frequently based on newer information, based on newer research, based on newer technology. Uh, they can change HD at will, and that leads to a lot of improvement and so on in these discrete time systems. So, so this is what's happening today. So if you really want to uh, uh, do something good with signals and systems, this is where you want to focus your attention in. This is the block in which you want to focus your attention in because this is where a lot of innovation is happening across a wide variety of fields, not just, not just one or two fields, but if you look at biomedical signal processing, if you look at uh, smart grid, uh, if you look at data centers, if you look at um, uh, what else, space, uh, space uh, technology, a lot of the places where you have analog to digital and digital to analog conversion in between digital to digital, there is a microprocessor sitting which is connected to the internet. And by coming up with newer and better algorithms that can run on that microprocessor, you can actually improve the overall end-to-end -end output of the continuous time system. Okay. Any questions so far before I move on to the next topic? Okay, let's uh, look at a digital differentiator. I have a signal XCT. I have this big block of various things that are happening. And I want my YC of T to be a differentiation of XC of T. So I want YC of T to be the derivative of XC of T. Now, of course, I know that my XC of T is band limited. So, and, and I'm not, I'm going to sample at a rate which is much higher than two omega M. So therefore there'll be no ally assing. So all of that is good. And the cutoff frequency is omega S over two or something so that there is no, uh, it's, it's, it's able to recover the original signal back. So I want my HC of J omega to be as follows. I want it to be J omega for omega less than omega C, I want it to be zero for omega greater than omega C. This is what I want from this, uh, for, the, for the overall end-to-end -end system. Now the question is, what should I put in the digital system? What should I put in the digital LTI system? What kind of system should it be? What should the transfer function of this system be? Now I know that HC of J omega should be HD of E raised to J omega T for omega less than omega C and it should be zero for omega greater than omega C. So from that, I can, I can understand what HD of E raised to J omega T should be equal to J omega, or in other words, HD of E raised to J omega should be J omega over capital T. This is for omega less than omega C. 
and this is for omega less than omega c over t no i think it should be omega c multiplied by t yeah this looks correct okay so you want your discrete time system if your discrete time system has an impulse uh, has a frequency response of j capital omega over t then the overall end to end system will have a differentiating property where the input signal will be differentiated at the output okay and that's a digital differentiator digital differentiator because the differentiation is happening because of the because of the digital system which sits between the digital uh, which sits between the analog to digital converter and digital to analog converter okay so this is just an example that illustrates that if you want a specific transfer function for the end to end continuous time system you can design the lti system the discrete time lti system in between in such a manner that the desired output will be exactly what you want it to be um and so differentiation is just one possibility you may want to have some other possibility some other way of uh, transforming the signal the input signal to this end to end continuous time system and you can get the corresponding uh, transfer function for the discrete time system which sits in between okay so that's all i have for today uh in uh, the friday's class we'll talk about decimation and um its effect so decimation is a topic that is related to the sampling of discrete time system uh, discrete time signals so we'll talk about decimation in in um, in friday's class and then we'll move on to the next chapter of uh, laplace transform thank you for your attention i'll see you guys all on friday